Well, um, when I was invited for this lecture, um, I felt really honored and I'd love to come to Brussels because for me, um, this is not one city, this is several cities and you have also several administrations and several people who have to say something, several languages, several cultures, and I love that um, because this is really unique and when we talk about the public, it's exactly the space or the area where all these uh, elements, where all these people, all these emotions um, come together. I um, originally wanted to talk about the Place Flaget. Um, not only, of course, but then I thought, you know, it's really boring because most of you know this space. And I thought uh, also um, to talk about some of our um, public squares and parks and whatever. And then I thought, well, there are so beautiful public squares and parks in um, this region of Europe. Um, it might be also boring. So I decided um, to talk about um, a different thing. Um, where the, the question is, um, how can it become public? So the question is not how to make a nice park, but how to make something public, um, which is um, the undesired, the things we don't like. I'm not showing you book, no, don't worry. It's too known, and today we desire industrial landscapes and love to change it into something. To what degree we know already. Um, and I showed the landscape park, and I guess also um, Peter, uh, my father, showed it several times also in Brussels. Um, it's not the thing. But what is it that uh, what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the spaces we're pushing out of the city. It's what we need to make our urban societies today um, to survive. It's um, the garbage, of course. I'm not talking about garbage today, but it's also the question of roads, of um, big infrastructural elements, uh, motorways, and um, also energy. And we really don't want to see that stuff because we are all, and that's very European and I think it's good, we love a romantic old European city. And I think we can be proud of that kind of city. I'm not so much a fan of um, the huge uh, cities I know from America, which are sometimes nice, but usually boring, horrible, Great, but I must admit I'm very European. Um, and we're touching on several themes. We're asking what is your vanity and how can we create it? And what makes it emblematical, something we can remember, makes it a place to be. Um, the social aspects become more and more important. And what is infrastructure? I can only pick out um, two little things and what for us is, 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 is their importance, not so much the design, because we always design differently, we don't have a style, we have a methodology, and we look on spaces and we want to understand these spaces with all our senses, also the infrastructure, also the horrible, the motorways, and so on, and transform it into something interesting. Whether that is industry, where we go also in with plants and look on what to do with the stuff and transform it, you know that project, because we're using it, and that is a principle. We want to make things usable, which are not conceived uh, as something which could be used. And our methodology tries to understand these landscapes. So we're coming basically from an engineering point of view and not so much from a design point of view. Um, and Duisburg was very important in that sense because we started to gain understanding in our office about the richness of these structures, which cost millions. And if we start to understand these areas as landscapes, we get a new understanding of our technical of today's world. Because when you look at many, many public spaces we created, and to a certain extent this concerns also the Place Flaget, there are some very conservative elements in there, um, we really try to regain public space with some classic schematic ideas. And when we see these areas and we understand what the pipes are for and what all the paths are for, why it's high, why it's low, why it has very different levels, and if we transform this into a landscape, we, we gain something which has a big value because it has cost billions to build that stuff. Why taking it down? Why changing it? 
or why covering it? Isn't it better to do something with it, something creative, to have people using it, and to even use the big holes, where usually specialists always tell us, oh, I don't know what to do with it. It's too expensive to make it perfect, so take it down. It's always the same discussion. And especially in Europe, despite all the examples which exist, we tend to take them down and do some boring green landscape. Nothing against green landscape, but we can do something better. And we tested that methodology in other countries, here in Lyon, the Porombo, in Bremerhaven, and all started to add, and that's a technology we're using, or a methodology, to use the, element, the existing elements, because the people living in this area, or around this area, have a specific attachment to these things. They love it, they like it. And everything we do is, this was in uh, Saint-Chamond, near Lyon, a study, um, and um, the, the idea is really to um, integrate that memory and make it part of the future. Pictures are th like this are not very new, but it's the same methodology which leads to the reuse of these fabric. We tried it also in Turin, and um, I show you the uh, only our images because it's now realized and we didn't have any grasp on the realization because in Italy things work differently, as you know, always. And this space is now created and they can play football under the biggest roof of the world for, for a public space. Football, baseball, they have assemblies and the biggest prayer for the breaking of Ramadan was under there, so there were like thousands of Muslims underneath praying because that structure, funny enough, is directed exactly to Mecca. <laughs> anyway, the Place Flagé is just one, it's that social aspect where we as landscape architects see these sculptures, um, these, these landscapes or these architectures as a social sculpture where we want to bring different people together. We don't want to functionalize the space still today, and I, I'm very critic, critique of that um, we're discussing with clients and with, um, even with designers um, not to put functionalized spaces. Where you say, okay, here we need something for the old people, you know, these moving things, etc. And here we need a kinder, um, for, for the kids something. Usually you have to put a fence around it. And, and then there should be something to play um, soccer and a baseball. We are absolutely against that because that has nothing to do with public space. That's private space. That's an assembly of private spaces. A football pitch, five-a-side, as they say in England, has nothing to do with public space. It's private. So what we do, and that's what we did also in Flagey, is make it public and look for public discussion, but also invite the leaders of industry, not the leaders of politics, because usually they change their mind after the public opinion and those of industrial leaders. So we invite these. This started very early. With the Green Belt in Frankfurt, I was a student at that time and invited um, with hundreds of other students <laughs> to do some um, special research on some areas. The main idea behind these things is to negotiate with the politics and the people concerned a new layout for landscape. Some of that today is uh, common sense and how to make it interesting. And Another aspect we're working on is, of course, temperature, climate. This is in Madrid. It's just under realization at the moment. Or the other one, which I don't want to show today, how to work with a little amount of water, which only falls in a few days in Israel. Or how to make spaces which are very functional, memorable spaces, like in uh, Dachau. You know that past, certainly interesting gravel surfaces and develop new things. We also do classic landscapes. That was the biggest master plan we did and the most costly one because the English have a very specific understanding of making master plans and consulting people. I guess the public consult consultation was three times as expensive as the work of all the designers and technicians and engineers and so on. But we made it. And these things persist and of course there's a book tell you that in the beginning because then you can write it down and before you forget it at the very end, the syntax of landscape. But I want to talk about energy and I want to talk about 
um, traffic. And you all know that traffic today is something like this. Yeah, it's not very pleasant to look at, usually. And um, we can design some of these elements, the edges, or those things which cross over, but it doesn't change the nature of these elements. And, um, but it started so nicely in the 50s and 60s. We had an urban vision to give access to private homes via motorways, sometimes directly. People wanted to have a direct junction into the heart of the city, you know what that uh, resulted in. And um, not to talk about the underground infrastructure we're all fighting with when we want to put some trees or some foundations for public amenities. But that's not really the problem. The problem is what happens above, it's the cars, is parking. And in Barcelona there was an important and big exhibition in the end of the 80s, beginning of 90s, there was a complete change in the perception of public space and they made a manifest even for public space and decided that the biggest threat is the unorganized traffic and parking. Well, we all know that, that's nothing new. It's common sense today, but it's hardly any other city besides the Barcelonian city has really changed something. Here in Brussels, in Munich where I come from, nothing has changed. In Barcelona, they simply decided to push the cars out. They didn't ask any engineers to calculate where to put it because that usually results in more traffic and more cars and more parking. This is a very interesting nature of these kind of calculations. We had it so often. This happened also in Place Flaget, but um, it's a different theme. And it resulted in some of the most wonderful spaces in Europe. I mean, these are the, only the most modern ones. I copied them out of the book because my photos were so bad. Um, or like in Seoul, um, Peter was over there, where they simply decided to take this motorway out. It's a very dense city, so they didn't know where to put the traffic, but they decided we don't want it anymore. <laughs> it's horrible. And that's the only way how to get rid of that. If you start constructions and to deviate, it's only creating more traffic and more. We just had that in Munich. We have a, um, just until 2003, I was going into the city on a two-lane motorway from the north. Fantastic. We had traffic jams, but well, five to 10 minutes more is no problem. Then they made everything bigger. Now we have six to eight lanes and we still have traffic jams. Nothing changed. Just six years later, we have the double amount of traffic. Nothing changed. It's the logic of these systems, and that's what happened in Seoul. They just took it out and created an artificial river where people can play, where there are no fences, and it's very good. That's Munich. That's the reality in Munich. It's the motorway which goes out west. I took a series of photos. i just show you some. And we invest an enormous amount of money. It's millions. I always wonder, once you start calculating that, how a society like ours can afford that. Now you know where the debt comes from. This is only sound protection, building behind, horrible to live there, just because they cannot decide that the cars, instead of going 100 km by hour, only go 50. There are so many traffic jams there, not much quicker anyway, they cannot decide it. It's a society which doesn't want to change, and that's what, how the landscape looks like beside. Well, sometimes quite nice, but unusable, just to decorate. Wasted space, and if you know how much a square meter costs in Munich, this is nonsense. But that's how they continue. This is our strange stadium, which is really great. I love it. Most of my co architect's colleagues hate it. Call it plastic bag, <laughs> but I love it. But in order to allow to live beside these things, this is the entrance of the city, you only go by 80 kilometers, is sound protection. This is one of the most effective ones in the whole world and they're very proud of it. It has costed, I don't know how many million euros. It's horrible. And that's how it looks from the back. Nice public space. Because of the fact that there are also two administrations, well, it's nothing which exists only in Brussels, in between, I don't, I don't have that photo, unfortunately, in between the sound insulation and the buildings, you see a little corner over there with some shy cars, there's the S-Bahn, the regional train. But it was two different administrations, they couldn't come together, 
So when the S-Bahn goes through, the sound goes directly into your living room. It's fantastic. And that's how we discuss. The other way, motorways lead to, because you drive fast, you have junctions and exits every 500 meters minimum. Better is one kilometer. You basically recreate an additional infrastructure beside. You're forced to do that. Because if not, you cannot go away from that. If not, you do not arrive here. So you're creating traffic. Even more than only driving on this one, you have to go around and zigzagging until you arrive at your point. Plus, you do wonderful architectural bridges, which gain prices and cost million for nothing because you cannot cross. It's horrible. And this is already in the outskirts of Munich. So why not changing just that little bit? I understand that you need motorways when you go over hundreds of kilometers in outside of the cities, but inside, why? Our society can change. And it was a wonderful concept. This is the concept of the 70s. You know this stadium. For me, it's the most beautiful in the world. And it's integrated in the landscape. It's fantastic, but unfortunately, the cars are not. And you need all these protection system, this, then a fence, and there's another fence higher up. I don't understand that anyway. I drive there very often, and you have to drive in a way and take care. You don't see the things beside anymore. And then you go into a tunnel. Wow, that's the maximum solution, the most expensive. Fantastic. If you ask a business person to calculate that, he would say you're crazy. But the public sector is willing to pay that. I'm happy because we're doing a project on one of these, but um, I think this is only the last solution. We should seek for others, if possible. And um, we're working on a tunnel in, in Munich. I'm not going to show much of that because you can create, of course, wonderful parks on that. But the problem of this is once you've, you have the tunnel, it's a very expensive system in terms of maintenance with ventilations and security and all these kind of things. And um, you still have the polluted air. So what to do with these? But the people like the park uh, once it will be constructed. So we tried another one because you still have to create a road above because putting it under the earth is not the solution. You still need a road on the top to bring the people to the houses. So we tried a kind of central boulevard um, after our Barcelona origins, which will be constructed in the next years, and allows for a public space, a separate public space, which doesn't belong to these buildings or these buildings, but belongs to the people of both sides, into the middle. But it's only another strategy. I want to show you a different one. It's in uh, Luxembourg, and um, Luxembourg had um, an extension of the town where you have one of the lowest densities in Europe, which was built perfectly after the idea of the car friendly city on this yellow spot. It was a city which was almost as big as the town of Luxembourg itself, and they started with a motorway, of course, um, because it was fashion at that time and they love it. It has six lanes, goes over to the other side. It's the biggest road in Luxembourg. It's interesting, you know, you build a city for 100. How many people are living in Luxembourg? I think 600,000 or 500? There's none, nothing like that. But for a little bit, for 100,000, 50 to 100,000, you need a motorway. This logic is, that's, that's fashion. Anyway, it functioned very well, so it was filling up slowly with European institutions, and suddenly it didn't work anymore because it was, how do you say, saturated. With only a few thousand people living there, Huge infrastructure. Can you imagine how much that costs? On the top, you see the density which was reached when we started the project. Um, I was still a student then. And um, the, the motorway over there, you see these fantastic junctions, which are only possible every three to four kilometers, which create then, if you want to get there, another road and another road and another road. You don't know where you are anymore, but you are at your home in the end. And the concept was done together with Jochen Jordan, architect from Frankfurt, and um, Christian, um, Christian Bauer from Luxembourg, also an architect, where we said we have to change something. And they decided, we proposed to the authorities to, to take that motorway out and create a boulevard. 
so that we have many, many little junctions. It was a big discussion, many experts saying, oh, that doesn't work, we rather have to double the lanes so that the motorway works also in the future. They were even talking about, um, uh, um, how do you say, um, to put another road above the road. Good idea, as you know. In New York, they had just taken them down at the moment. And so we started, of course, at these times it was postmodern, so it was the dense, classic European city with the wonderful streets, that didn't work out that way, but um, we came close. We started to develop landscapes, which were going into these kind of very unorganized architecture. The architecture in the city was organized following the logic of the motorway. There was no urbanism, and there are still cities which work like that until today. So this is a kind of landscape, working with all these nice things, collecting water, having existing paths, and then there was this one. And look at this, uh, this image. I mean, because of the speed, there's only a few cars. You know, their saturation is reached very quickly. That's why then suddenly you have traffic jams. That's the logic of the motorway. And all these green spaces are lost spaces for nothing. They cost maintenance. They are unusable. Nothing can be built there, also for security reasons. And um, it's a very expensive infrastructure. And the only thing which can happen there is cars. So we proposed to change that. And that was the result. And we're very happy that the authorities of Luxembourg allowed that. It's not perfect yet, because some things were changed. Um, the engineers of Luxembourg um, convinced the authorities that we cannot have so many junctions. Um, so we created the so-called very classic system, the, um, how do you say, it's in French, the, um, um, the contre allée, in order to have all the inlets into the city, but the engineers were very clever and said we cannot make so many, otherwise it will flood all these areas, they believed it, so, but the road works. And what is important especially, it takes many different ways to commute and uh, go through the city and um, suddenly you have crossings. And you can turn left and right. They will build a tramway on this one, and people can walk. It's still very long because most of the architecture is not yet built, but it starts. And you can cross, can you imagine that this was a motorway? It is possible, and it's interesting because if you take down the speed, you have two times as many cars on these surfaces. Of course, it needs a bit more time to get through, but that's what urban life is about. We shouldn't go too fast in order to be able to, co to communicate, to meet, and to come together. Not everything is golden over there, of course, until the boulevard is fully constructed and there's a little piece missing. Um, they have a fence in the center so that people don't walk over. And as you know, these kind of temporary things always stay. It will be a big, big discussion but people can cross it and use it, and there's no tunnel, there's no whatsoever. And I just want to tell you about a little anecdote, how to convince people it didn't work. All the people building new houses, like this is a big shopping center, they were just laughing at us, not only the designers, but also the authorities, and saying, that never works, what is that? So um, we built it without taking care of them, but we had to build because there were contracts, the roads to the shopping center, which was a classic system, so we had to go around the shopping center to a huge parking, and then you enter the shopping center and no contact to the road. And what happened later, it's very funny, you see it a little bit here, suddenly they found out the street works. There's cars parking here, there's people walking, there's bicycles. So they opened what was once the backside in order to have restaurants and entrances and shops and whatever over there. This is an old picture, um, but it's still the same. People are eating now where once was the useless green of the motorway. What happens in the areas where you have landscape beside? Well, you would say, okay, you make a walkway. What means, because of the fact that, you do, um, that it's not going into the third dimension, you don't see it. So this is also something important when you drive along a road and you want to make something visible, it's not done in just opening it. 
people don't look at that. You have to celebrate it. So we convinced the authorities to construct some of these kind of um, little trellises and, and constructions where there is landscape beside, which is um, today very important because these elements, and that's something which is important in public space, the elements where people walk have to be stronger than the functional elements. So the third dimension for us in our work is, is, is quite important. And the same happens here, so you have the, the boulevard on one side, and then this element where people are walking, um, not on this picture, <laughs> and you have the landscape beside, so you celebrate basically the landscape, you, ke you keep free from architecture also in the future. That's how it looks like, and the authorities put a lot of money into these elements which up to now work quite well. A completely different approach is to accept the motorway. Um, there is a very interesting motorway in the Ruhr area, the A42. You must know that the Ruhr is worked in west-east direction, so basically from the Rhine up to Dortmund. And um, basically going north-south is very difficult, and always, I always lose completely orientation. And this is one of these motorways which is completely detached from the city, as all motorways, and they were asking what to do with it. Um, and launched a competition where we were selected for in the end, together with Integral from, um, uh, from Switzerland. And that's how it looks like in some areas. The speed is said to be without any limit, but of course they don't go much fa uh, faster than um, 40 to 100. 40 because there's so many traffic jams, you can't go f uh, quicker than that. And that's how it looks. It's completely greened on both sides. That might be nice for ecology, I doubt it, but that's what they say. And um, it's boring. 40 kilometers of boring road. And we were asking what to do with that. And <laughs> that's a cliche, of course. But we're working with cliches sometimes and transform it, or try to transform it into a concept. And we were discussing with um, the collaborators from Integral what to do. And our idea was to say, we cannot change the motorway and make it beautiful or put some art pieces somewhere and whatever, because it's detached from the landscape beside and you cannot enter it anyway. It's a security space. But maybe we can transform the perception of that area. So we decided to work with cliches cliches of landscape which make maybe this kind of motorway a park motorway and that was the task also in that competition to call it park motorway, Emscher Park motorway, something like this, A42. And we know right beside are all these landscapes existing but basically you do not really see it if you're not walking. So this is very nice, you know, you have these fantastic materials out of ore, out of um, uh, coal and all the gravel which comes from the mines which creates fantastic biotopes and a richness which doesn't exist usually in these areas but we cannot use it. So we were again starting with a transformation like talking, it's, it's a very old concept, thinking of taking it as it is, the perception, the speed, the, 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 the the driving, the existing vegetation and just doing something with it, transforming its visible thing. Oops, that's dangerous. There are some possibilities to work with also the, um, with, the, with the berms around it, but we said the most effective thing is landscape. And as you know, when you drive through some landscape and you see the vertical um, elements, I mean, this of course is the biggest and the greatest and most successful, this is Tuscany in Italy, and you have the vertical stems of the cypresses, you immediately think you're in Arcadia, even if, beside, there's poor farmers working like mad to get some pure olives and to have some goats. They earn their life with only a few euros. And it's, it's really hard work, it's a tough landscape, but for us, it's park, it's Arcadia. It's a dream. Easy to produce. You know this exists in Holland, in Germany, but also in Belgium, like mad, these kind of tree nurseries. And we decided we put some of them around the motorway and change the existing landscape without changing anything. We change the perception. It's a trick, but just adding a little element. 
which works within the existing logic. Some first sketches. And in the beginning, we still had some typical urban elements like benches or whatever, but we throw them out very quickly, saying that we don't need that. We, it's too much, and you won't see it because you drive 80 kilometers per hour or 100. But you might see this even behind, I mean, this takes some years, of course, even behind the sound protection elements, you would see that, and you get a complete different impression. So something which was normal and ordinary looks like, well, not Tuscany. And this continuously, not so many, just in specific locations. A few of them is already enough. Minimal intervention. We gained first prize with that proposal, but also because we had some other elements. And um, this was the so-called park station, um, where people were meant to drive out at the junctions and get informed, get something to eat, some frit and other stuff, have some toilets, and have some art stuff. And um, it was designed in existing parking or for existing parking locations. And the idea was to see it from the motorway. This is already beside the motorway. To see these huge shields, it's a light concrete construction, which just floats within the landscape, but also along the motorway. So there are some of these positions where you could basically um, identify immediately a spot of attention because there's so many things going on in the Ruhr, but many people I know don't go there because they think it's a maze and they get lost. I get lost in the Ruhr. It's a maze of traffic and motorways and whatever. And here you get the information and directly orientated towards the uh, special places also at night. Well, unfortunately, um, this had a price, but I come to that later because Integral had also a very important intervention which I want to show you because you, when you're driving on a motorway, you don't see the landscape, you only see motorway landscape, which is autistic, which is completely separated. And we wanted to show the landscape, the human landscape beside and proposed big shields where there are, just like a commercial in the streets, where there are new faces every X months. So we took people from living beside to give it a specific identity, and this could change over years. What happens sometimes could be also visible at night as an orientation, but not more. They are minimalistic because the regulations on security on motorways is very tough, and which could also be seen at daytime. You know, old people, young people, and um, the discussion was then how to select these people, because that's difficult. There are millions of people living in the Ruhr. Who is it? Is it the Turkish guy? Is it the origin, originally Polish guy? Because the Ruhr consists of many people whose origin is Polish. Who could it be? But the client was, would be happy to do it. That's what he said at that time. Another idea besides the visual things and our memory which creates the landscape was writing. A landscape architect working with writing, this can only go wrong. Well, I was um, inspired by this symbolic, symbolic thing, which I always saw when driving from West Germany to Berlin at the time when there was still the wall. And this was fantastic. I never forgot it. It was so symbolic, so strong. And it was talking about something which you couldn't see at the motorway. And it was not only a product, it was an identity and still is an identity today for the city. So we decided to um, develop a series of words talking about the Ruhr about very concrete things like blue eggs, here this one. It's a kind of nickname for, um, uh, for uh, um, a water cleaning facility, but also um, real names or identities which we would like to see in an industrial area, but also its toughness. And we developed these kind of big words which we wanted to put along the motorway. And when you drive along a motorway, usually you don't see anything except the road. It's a second where you see something. But this one could be seen because it's right beside the motorway. And when you don't see this, you see this, and the image starts to evolve in your head. So actually, a landscape, as you know from theory, exists only in our head. It's, con it's a constructed thing. It's individual. And we wanted to steer that with our creation. Oh, where is it? There it is. So you don't see the gasometer, you think it's an industrial structure, but 
because of our commercial um, addiction, you know, our perception is very much formed by media and by television. We look at this, read it, and say, oh, this must be important. We could even write after a certain uh, time about places which nobody knows and are not at all important, but just because it's written down, people would think by driving by, oh, this is very important. That's how perception functions in our modern world. So we did many of them. Another one was some doors, but that was not so important, where we said we concentrate our trees at the beginning and at the end of the motorway to make it more important, but we weren't very sure about that. At other icons, we all we skipped that in our later work. Oops. But the entrance could be something like this. Oh, the motorway is important. It's written down. It's not the typical blue sign, or I think in Belgium it's a different color. Is it blue in Belgium? Anyway, and <laughs> this was, that was then basically the, the idea to, to have that also at night with a bit of light, not too much because of the regulations, to also underline, you see the landscape park Duisburg Nord, which is a landmark, to make it even stronger, to add something which is not in concurrence to the, to the signs and the logic of the motorway, but adds an artistic uh, thing, also put into into perception the still working facilities, but also other elements like old cloisters or other things. The client was happy, we worked on that very much and had a lot of fun with that and spent a lot of money, but then what happened was something different. We added also this idea that was the last point where we said, well, take the speed down and you save a lot of money because the regulations make motorways extremely expensive when you go down to the speed which, in which they drive usually anyway, you could say, but that was another thing. The whole project collapsed basically and wasn't realized because the communities who funded that were bankrupt in 2010. It was official and since that they cannot do any big projects anymore. So it was canceled. Maybe it comes up in one of the next years. Now I come to energy, and energy is something we don't want to see. We are absolutely clear about the fact that electricity comes out somewhere, but behind that is an enormous machinery. It's not only the, um, the stations where they make the energy, the electric energy, it is made by storage facilities by enormous systems which are not visible for us because we pushed them out of the city. We pushed them out. We still have some small facilities in some cities, but the infrastructure is not seen. And one of the infrastructures we will have more and more in the future, it's only one of many, is storage facilities which work with water. It's a bit difficult system for uh, Holland. It's a bit too flat. But um, in, uh, in areas where you have high big height differences, even in the Ruhr also, where they talk about having these facilities in the old mines and try to do um, research on that. We have them s since more than 100 years. One of the oldest ones, for example, is in, is in, is in Brasilia, is in Brazil, sorry. It's, um, it's, it's a huge one in Sao Paulo, I think. And this is a typical one in Germany. And I cannot tell you the name of the project because it is still under discussion, not this one, it's another one. But um, because of the public who works on that, because we're all, of course, we want a complete change of our society. We want to change our electric facilities, but not in my backyard, of course. So the discussion is, is fierce and really wild. So I want to show you an approach, what to do with that. Well, it's a high security area. You cannot put anything into the lakes. Of course, no islands, no beauty. You cannot use the water. You cannot swim in it. You cannot fish in it, even though there is some fish. And it's a very specific biotope also. There is life, not much, but there is. Basically, the water is always as warm as the earth. And um, because of the permanent pumping up and down, it becomes even warmer. So in summer, you have to, up to 30 degrees in this, in this water. It's really warm. Amazing stuff for me. And um, that's how it functions, pumping up, pumping down, according to the energy you have 
as a plus and you don't need, so you pump water up and when you need energy, of course, you let it fall down. It's several megawatts um, you can create with that, but only for a period of about up to three days. And that helps a lot to um, make our society fit for, uh, to accept alternative energies, wind energy, solar energy, etc. It's huge facilities, enormous pipes. Can you imagine that this pipe would create like up to four or five megawatt? It's amazing, and it goes up to 800, 900 meter through big, um, through mountains. And of course, since we're having, uh, since Fukushima, we have this discussion even more fiercely in Germany, these stations will be created even more often. And this is one of these examples. What happens to such a landscape? It might look like this. And this is not a river which floats into that water. Basically, the water is pumped from somewhere to have a permanent uh, water level. And this is only the lower basin. And there will be also a top basin, which is big like a little town. It's up to now one of the most efficient ways to store energy, and that's how they look like. Usually they are not fully filled because the water goes permanently up and down, but within a kind of security level. And the edges look like this. There's nothing happening. The dam where you can sometimes walk on looks like this. It's pure concrete. And this is only the lower basin. The top basin is usually put on the top of a hill. So basically you have, you can really imagine you have a kind of bathtub on top of the hill. Around it there is a slope of earth, but inside it's an asphalt bathtub. Huge, enormous asphalt bathtub. So what to do with that? We also got the contract now for the top basin, but um, I only want to show you the lower basin today, because that's how we got it in the end. So what to do, for example, with a huge this is a 600 meter concrete wall on the top. This is already our proposal. But our idea was that this landscape has to be used. So it's not just something you look at and we think, oh goodness, 600 meter of concrete, a huge wall. I don't want to be there, I hate it. No, we have to make it something which you can use. So it's a bit like what we learned from Duisburg, that these blast furnaces become the, look best, um, the best lookout po points in the whole rural area. Because usually it looks like this, or like this, it's wonderful. You have these in the Alps, very naked, basically. But this is the lower basin, it's not the top basin. Don't have a picture of that yet with me. And the concept was to maximize acceptance, how to do that. Not against, but with the object. So to understand the construction and do something with the material they use to make the technology visible, not to fence it away, but because it's attractive. People want to see how things function. And usually, our dear friends, not the engineer, it's rather the security engineer, puts the fence as far away as possible from the object. That's why you don't see, for example, in big harbors locks anymore, because you have to stop walking 15 meters to 20 meters before you reach them. And that this makes a kind of new landscape via also participation and communication. I mean, that's normal to steer curiosity, have people going there. There's a big interest in technical things. To present things also, to be open and transparent and make as a first action a visitor center. And this visitor center could symbolize, and that was the idea, could symbolize the highest possible water level, which will never be reached, only in catastrophe moments. So this happens once every 50 years. And there is the visitor center on top where you have a lookout point and where you see the construction site where millions of cubic meters of earth will be moved. It's extremely loud and there's many things happening and you open a landscape. I mean, you know these kind of things. It's very interesting to have lookout points and to do something special over there. People love it. Of course, this is not the Atlantic, but maybe something like this could be interesting where you're almost at water level and look out even if there's no water yet or will never be maybe. The first question from their side was how much does it cost? So we were happy, but of course everything is a bit more difficult. The second one, so it was a kind of simulation of the top water level. 
to simulate what is not there, what is not existing. So we did a second level on the same, um, on the same height with some um, jetties where people can walk into the area, but not to be above water, but to be above the construction site, to gain acceptance by being as open as possible. Because it's fascinating when you have such a big hole and such a big construction and to have many of these things to make the walk around this lake interesting. So far, so simple. These kind of lookout points are always interesting, also in big parks. I mean, this is just our project, but you know this from many of our colleagues. And the most spectacular and newest one is this one. It's completely ridiculous, I mean. But it works like mad. People love it. I mean, of course, such a kind of pumping storage facility is not the Grand Canyon. But what you see from this point is the same thing what you could see before when you were standing here. Nothing really changes. I mean, you're a bit further out. You walk over glass. So it's nothing for people who have fears in the heights. But suddenly, there is a point. And instead of walking around the landscape and being fascinated by the landscape, from every point, all people go here, pay money, and buy articles afterwards in the shop beside, of course. This is a fantastic success. I don't want to say I love it, um, because I could imagine to live without that one, but it's very clever, because it works with people's perception of landscape. It's like the commercial, you know? You see the Milka cow with this color, and see the Alps behind. The world is not like this, but from that moment on, you have that picture in your mind, and when you see something which is almost like, you say, oh, this is especially beautiful, or this is very good. It's very interesting. And when you build something like this, people say, oh, here is the best view. This is fantastic, because they got told. People love to be told where to go. People love to be told what to do. It's amazing. That's how it works. So we say, we'll do some of these structures, and suddenly the walk is interesting, although it's quite boring in most of the times. It's like, this is a trick, of course. And now we wanted to work with the material and the actual situation. One was that when drilling these, this kind of pipe through the mountains, 800 meter difference, the size of a little house, so you get like thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, tons of cubic meters of material, and we wanted to create with this, in a way, the fall, to make the landscape visible again. Not to cover it with landscape, to make it invisible, but rather to open it up and show where you have the historic landscape and the new landscape, and use the rubble. And they wanted to cover it in the beginning. The engineers wanted to put it somewhere, put green above it so you don't see it, and we say, well, maybe better like this. And there are many examples where people go to the most horrible places on Earth to climb on them. This is complete nonsense in terms of security, um, health insurance, but people love it. This is the attraction. I mean, this of course is millions of years old or hundreds of thousands of years old. It's, it's something completely different, but we know by our experience in urban space that people love artificial places. So you know all these crazy guys who climb in these climbing centers? It's completely artificial, but they love it. This is urban. So we said, we're doing this. And then we had a second theme. So this is this kind of fold, this kind of signal in the landscape, making the landscape understandable, visible, and at the same time, creating a tourist attraction. But what made us win that competition was a different thing. Of course, we made green slopes, biotopes, mm -hmm, standard. Nice, of course. We proposed to work with maintenance, nothing new today. Some of you know that very well, it makes fun. This is our garden in front of the office. So we're cutting green and create different colors and all that just by working with maintenance, normal. And then we had that idea with the wall. I hope I'm not missing now the right moment in my lecture. But this concrete wall, 25 meters high, in the inside up to 60 meters high, 70 meters, is 600 meter long. It's rammed concrete, there's no iron inside, it's not reinforced, it's a kind of heavyweight structure, which will be created within four years of permanent pouring out of concrete. By activity, 
So we propose to do something with this wall and to change its nature. And it's a little bit like the old industrial structure we used in Turin for, to, to create the biggest covered, covered um, public place in Europe, I think it is. To do here a different study, to morph it for two reasons. The first one was that the 600 meter long structure gets a kind of micro identity where we integrate maybe um, uh, cages for birds and for nesting and especially also for bats, which are ecologically very important. But then we said, who is the guy who does all that in the ecological system? It's the men. It's mankind, it's humanity. So what could we do with this? It could be like this. I mean, I was climbing once through something like, like this, a bit easier than that, it's a bit too complicated for me. But um, I was climbing, we could also climb in concrete, and we had that experience from Duisburg and said, we're proposing that for this project. And we know it needs only little people, people love artificiality. We know this from Duisburg, where these kind of bunkers become, became an alpine center, a very important one. And it's used by many people, so we said, we're doing this. And this becomes the biggest climbing wall in Europe. <coughs> it's not that easy in construction terms, because the pouring out of concrete has a lot of logic, which is rather linear, but they want to do it at least at a, not at 600 meter, but a bit less, because it becomes a bit expensive. And this becomes a tourist attraction. So people would go there. These people are looking in Duisburg on people who climb. And they come to watch people climbing in concrete. Simple walls. So there's not these kind of folded um, eruption masterpieces in these alpine clubs you have all around Europe. It's a simple concrete walls. And you have all degrees of difficulties in there up to the degree 12 or 10, I think. And people look at it, and they come into the park and have this attraction. And if nobody is climbing, they can talk about it because the grips are still there. And that will be the wall. They already told us 600 meters is a bit too much and too expensive, but it will be the biggest one and an attraction. And suddenly, instead of covering it up, putting trees in front of it, I mean, this is a very simple idea, isn't it? putting trees in front of it, covering it, that you don't see it, and that the town underneath has a vision like before, or almost like before. We open it up, we make it visible, we show the technicality of things, and we say, you can do something with that. Technical things can be interesting and wonderful. And this brings me also to some additional things, like the warm water creates mist, not always, but very often. We can do something with the mist. It's a very specific thing. And we added another very urban thing, very commercial, rays of light via laser. And maybe this works. And we can measure the lake, which will never reach that moment, or only once every 50 years. <coughs> you can watch that. And people are watching that. I mean, if you go through a harbor, there are these kind of elements. And what do people look at? The steel, the horrible ships which today ship cars from Europe to Japan and from Japan to Europe, because they look like big black boxes. But people love to look at that. And I hope they look at our lasers. And then there is the biggest problem we had to deal with. And we deal with, that was our main theme was how to deal with the fact that usually this lake is half empty or half full, however you take it. And that it goes up and down and sometimes quite a lot. And that this huge surface is not very interesting, has nothing tangible. And then we started to look at it a little bit like, um, like kids in a way. And I'm always trying in my work to step back from my pure design and theory and philosophy and whatever and everything I learned and what many of you all learned, of course, when you were doing your studies, and try to think, what if I'm not a student, professional, or like 30, 50, 40 years old, but what if I'm just a little child walking around? I think most of it is very, very boring. And we had the idea of creating something within that lake, 
which is of the same nature, but tells you that there is like a civilization maybe, that there is a colony, that something is happening there. So we proposed at a very early stage to have some mini dams where there is life to keep the water up so that it's not permanently going up and down and to celebrate the flow of water that there may be some openings where it goes down down very, very slowly. You must know that this, these kind of lakes change by 40 centimeters within an hour. So there's a huge potential to deal with that enormous power. This is megawatts. This is not water. This is megawatts which go down. And suddenly there we have maybe the possibility to create some poetry. Maybe there's more. And it creates a landscape. And the question we will raise, like little kids, they see something and ask immediately, why is that? We ask, why is that? It's complete nonsense in terms of technology. But it might be something you can attach to in memory and say, maybe there were people. Why are they doing that? Were there fish? Was there fish? Was there whatever? There is fish in these lakes, although some are shredded when they go through these pipes. But um, they live. Maybe there's even more. So a technical process and a completely technical basin, huge, this is a kind of stone bathtub, becomes a landscape and develops its own stories via the flow of water, something which is nothing else but water retention. Well, they love the project, and we hope we survive the public consultation, which will not be on our landscape interventions, but the whole project as such. Because as you know, very modern people who are for alternative energy can turn into extreme conservative people suddenly and be absolutely for atomic power if they hear that something like this happens in their backyard. But I think that's our future. We have to accept these systems. I mean, this is just one. And we will also accept more and more systems which will be in our neighborhood, which will be within the cities and not far out anymore or will be where we do our holidays more and more, and we have to live with that and do something with it. That's how it could look like. So we're working with the rammed concrete. On the top right, it's a very famous predecessor from Zumtor in Cologne on the Columba building, which is a museum building where he worked with rammed concrete, not with rammed earth. And you want to use a material like this, maybe signalizing here not only the height which we reach, because the height difference is up to 40 meter in the normal process, but maybe also the megawatts we're having still in the lake when we reach a certain height. So it could be very nice. And then I had a last idea, which was then saying, well, there should be more. And we wanted to drill into the naked cliffs, the rocks which we find beside, and there will be many and maybe drill little holes with nothing inside, which will be drilled in a way that some water stays over there. I hope you can see that over here in the sketch, it's a bit small. And there's water, nothing else. It's just an element where, which steers your memory and your imagination and your thoughts because you cannot go there, or you shouldn't go. Around this one is no fence. The top one has a fierce fence. Um, that this also steers your memory. So there's a set of tools how to make this lake something possibly interesting. And that's how it will look like on a normal day, empty. And you still have some water, maybe some Nixus paths, and you walk around and you ask yourself questions without immediately doing things after a climbing. I mean, we all have all these usual things we have to do them as well. We have to do the walks. We have to say how many kilometers, etc. But usually that's all which is happening around these big pools. And we want to do a little bit more. It was adopted by the mayors of the towns. And they are quite positive. So they hope that this is going to be done. And because of the fact that these institutions who create these huge infrastructures, and I'm not only talking about these ones. I'm talking about the power facilities. I'm talking about or the industrial facilities in the new harbors, not in the old ones, which is always nice. I'm talking about um, all other facilities like motorways, etc. There's a huge field for landscape architects to play with. And landscape architecture is desperately needed in this field to make it rich. It's not about design. 
about decorating it or covering it. It's about using our creative imag imagination to convince people that they can integrate this in their everyday life. And that is basically the end. Thank you very much for your...